Hello, so as she said, I am Andrew Brinker and I'm here today to talk about documentation in the Rust ecosystem. Basically, why do docs matter? What kinds of docs do we need to consider? Like, just what are the different sort of types that, are, that should be available uh, for a library? How are docs in the Rust ecosystem looking right now? And how, what can we do in each of our different community roles to make the, the documentation as good as it possibly can be? And I, I want to say, actually, just I'm, I'm very happy that it's, this seems to fit so nicely with the, the uh, previous talk. I think the idea of Rust being a productive documentation is uh, definitely a part of that, and so that's nice. So uh, first things first, I think it's important just to understand what we mean by docs. Uh, are there different types of docs? What are the goals and characteristics of the different types of documentation? Basically, what does the word docs include? Uh, and I'd like to I sort of think of them in, in three categories, the meet cute, the black triangle, the walkthrough, and the reference. Um, and I, th I think it's also important to note that each of these types of docs uh, can, can be present in, in different uh, actual documents. So you may have one document that has several of these. Um, this isn't talking about like a, a particular document. Like you, you could have, for example, a, a walkthrough and a reference that are both using Rust doc. Um, so this is more about a, the concept of the documentation itself rather than the documents that are being used to communicate it. So uh, the meet cute is answering the most basic questions about your library. It's what is this thing? Why should I care? Like, is this useful to me? Uh, usually you'll see this at like the top of a readme. It's your, your shortest pitch of why does this thing exist, right? Because if you, if you don't have that, if you, don't, aren't, you can't convince a person when they come look at your library that this thing is something that they need, or if they don't even know what you're doing, they have no idea what your library is, no one's going to use it. And so this is sort of the, the most basic uh, piece of documentation. Next you have the, the black triangle, which is the, the simplest code to do something good. So uh, the, the name, the black triangle, actually comes from a story by a developer at Rampant Games. They were developing a, a new game and it built up this whole new uh, asset pipeline and graphics rendering system and just a whole bunch of stuff. and. Uh, had been working for several months and hadn't really had anything to show up for it. It was all sort of down in the weeds work and they hadn't gotten anything to go through the whole system and actually display. And finally they did and it was a, a black triangle and everyone in the, in the uh, project who was uh, working on that was very, very excited to see this, this little black triangle on the screen because they knew that it had gone through all of this other stuff that they'd written and it, it showed that uh, what they'd already done and showed what they could do now, now that they had all this stuff in place, they could actually go about building the game and so I think that y y have, you want sort of the same response from your, your simplest example, your simplest thing that shows, hey, here's how this thing works at a most basic level. Uh, here's what it enables you to do. And so that's really what the, uh, the black triangle is. It is the simplest code to do something good, do something cool, sort of entice people to explore more. Uh, the walkthrough, I would say, is probably the hardest part. Uh, this is guiding people through the, the design of, of whatever it is you've made, making sure that they, they understand it and that at the end of it feel like they can go and actually build something. So for Rust, like I think the, the Rust book would be sort of an example of this, that it's, and obviously that's a very large walkthrough, but it's explaining all of the different little ideas in Rust, the different parts of the language, and at the end of reading the Rust book, a person should generally feel capable of going and making something with Rust. And so you're looking at the, the same sort of idea for your individual library. Um, this, is, this is difficult to write, and I will get into that in a little bit. Uh, and finally, you have the reference. This is your, your API reference. This is the complete thing. It says every little component you've got, uh, how it works, how the things interrelate. Uh, and it's, I think the most important thing to remember here is that people can come at this documentation from all sorts of different directions. It's, it's not like a walkthrough where it's very sort of directed. There's a single path through. The API documentation can come from anywhere, and so the biggest thing there is providing at any given point uh, context for the people who are reading it, making sure that they're, you, they don't you know, jump into some spot and they have no idea of what's happening, or if they do, that there's some clear way to find out what they don't know. When it comes to documentation, uh, docs are often the first thing people see. Before they actually look at your code, before they do anything with your library, people are likely to, to look at the readme, look at, at, at ex some examples. Having that, that first documentation be good is, is really important because, frankly, first impressions are important. Documentation is how your library says hello. And making sure that that, that hello, making sure that that first impression is good is uh, 
is very, very important. And most of all, good docs are really needed for productivity with a library. Um, people aren't going to be able to, to build things, do things with your code. No one wants to, to actually go through all the code itself to figure out what are you providing to them, how do the parts work together, how do you use it. People want to have docs. So uh, it's just it's important to, uh, to actually make sure you do that. And to give a, a sort of case study about this, I'm going to talk a little bit about the creation of the Rust Frequently Asked Questions page. Now, how many people here knew that Rust had a Frequently Asked Questions page? Ah, cool. <laughs> uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, if you go to the Rust website, uh, you go to the documentation page, and just the link at the top, there's a, on that page a link to the Frequently Asked Questions page. Right now, it's got um, just under 120 questions and answers. Uh, and I highly recommend people check that out. Uh, and if you have any problems with it, uh, please let me know. <laughs> I'm happy to, to work on it uh, with you. So the, the process for the Frequently Asked Questions page was uh, basically done in three phases. Um, and I think that, that this, these three phases provide a good template for working on documentation in other contexts. So the first was community outreach. About a year ago, some of you all may have, may have seen uh, posts on like the Rust subreddit or the user forum or Lobsters or Hacker News, wherever, uh, maybe on Twitter, asking for feedback about common questions people have with, uh, with Rust. Uh, if you remember that, that, those questions were what uh, eventually went into the frequently asked questions page. Um, in this particular case, this process was a, a really nice fit because it's a frequently asked questions page, and so it's nice to just ask, what are your questions? And then there you go. You have them. You just need to organize them and answer them. Uh, so that's, but, but the idea of community outreach, the idea of reaching out to uh, your users or, or to potential users who've maybe looked at the thing you've made and said, no, that's not for me, uh, reaching out to them and finding out why they didn't use it or, or what they don't like about it, what their questions are, uh, it's a really, really valuable thing to get a sense of what you're missing. Um, and the, the first thing to know is to, it, it's useful to reach as far as humanly possible. So for this, this just meant posting uh, sort of the solicitation for questions on as many places as we could think of. Uh, I know the Rust Twitter account tweeted about it and uh, got some people through that. Just making sure that you're really not, like you don't want to miss people. The, the more input you get, uh, it's just, it's always valuable. You're never going to be like, oh, no, I'm done. I don't, I don't want any more feedback on this. It's, you just you want as, ri as wide a reach, as many eyes, as many people contributing uh, as possible. And next is to, to take all input seriously. One of the things I found is like when you've worked on a thing, you've built a thing, you are often one of the worst judges of what's easy to understand or hard to understand about it or like what people are going to have issues with. It's easy to forget what it's like to be someone who's completely new to something, has no idea what's going on. Um, and it, or it's easy to, when people do give that feedback, to kind of ignore it or discount it or say, oh, well, I think they're overstating how hard this is. Or, like, you want to take your, your users or people who are giving feedback, you want to take them seriously. You want to really listen to uh, what they're telling you. And you want to check for existing sources. One of the nice things about being a programmer is that we like to ask our questions in the public. We, we you know, put stuff on Stack Overflow, and that provides actually a really nice place where you can go and say, hey, what are people asking? What are people having trouble with? And uh, in this particular case, the stuff we found on Stack Overflow was pretty much uh, the, it, it, in line with what we were getting from the, the direct feedback, but it provided more confidence in, okay, we need, we're addressing the right stuff. And it did fill out a couple of things that hadn't been uh, caught in the sort of uh, survey. So you know, if you have pre-existing uh, materials that tell you what things people are having issues with, what questions people are having, go look at them. Make sure that you're actually answering the questions that uh, people have already shared. So the next part, and this is really the, the hardest part, is the first draft. It's just going from a blank screen or a blank piece of paper to something. Uh, this part for, for me took me about uh, a month. That was like just working my free time. Took me about a month um, on it, about initially 100 questions. And uh, it's just tough because there's this, you can have this sort of pressure to, to get it right the first time, this sort of you need to have all of the, the perfect framing, the perfect uh, contextualization, uh, the best examples and explanations, and you get sort of paralyzed because you don't, you don't know how to, how to just get that right away. Uh, and so the first thing to, to really remember, you don't need to know everything. I didn't. I wrote answers that were wrong. I wrote answers that were incomplete, uh, wrote answers that were just bad. But I wrote answers. 
and then people could come in and, and give feedback and say, hey, this is, this is bad, this is wrong, this is whatever. And so I ended up learning a lot. I, I became, I think, a, a better Rust programmer from writing the uh, Frequently Asked Questions page because people came in and told me when I'd gotten something wrong or I you know, didn't know something. And just being able to say, hey, I don't know something, but I'm going to write anyway is, uh, is really important just because once you have a starting point, it gets a lot easier. And it's OK to write poorly. We're human. Sometimes we just don't words good. It just <laughs> doesn't. People, you know, you, you can't be expected to get all of the wording right, have the perfect sentences that are uh, crystal clear. Everything needs revision. It is the very rare person who doesn't need to edit something that they've written. So I think letting go of this idea that you have to get it right the first time, uh, make sure all your grammar is right, and, and sort of pre-edit it before you show it to anyone, uh, you don't need to do that. Really just because some docs are better than no docs. Having a, a starting point, something that can be critiqued and improved and, and worked with, is so much better than having a blank screen or a blank page. It, just, just because, I don't, I don't know about you, but I find it's, as an example, a lot easier to critique the opinion of someone else than it is to come up with your own opinion. And it's the same sort of idea. It's when there's something to, to take a stance against or to take a stance in favor of, like it, it becomes a lot easier than just sort of inventing something from whole cloth. Uh, and then you get to move on to the, the next stage, which is the longest stage, uh, refinement or editing. M taking that terrible, probably, thing that you've written and making it not terrible. Uh, so for me, the, the initial stage took about uh, two months. The, the refinement stage took about three months working. Uh, you know, I wasn't getting part-time, so it wasn't a, a job. First thing, don't fear the delete key. It can be easy once you've spent a lot of time on something to feel really attached to it and not, like, want, not want to give it up. Um, this is, this is going to make the end product worse. If people are telling you that something isn't clear, something doesn't work, listen to them. You need to, you know, if it, you, you can't be completely attached to the things that you've written or like have some sort of sense of, of self-worth uh, tied up in these things. Um, I'll say it's easier uh, said than done. It's easy when you've spent a lot of time in something to get defensive when people come and, and critique it. And letting go of that is uh, a really valuable thing. And next, get outside opinions. Uh, working on the Frequently Asked Questions page, we had a ton of people uh, who came in and, and gave really, really thorough feedback. It was actually a pretty cool experience because it was a, a fairly long document. I was surprised at the number of people that were willing to go through like the whole thing multiple times and, uh, and, and critique stuff and participate in, in like discussions about how things, how wording could be improved and, and things. Like People were really generous with their time and attention. And uh, it's, it's good to recognize that and to value that people are, are doing that. And finally, just to, uh, to listen, I know I keep saying this, but it can be difficult to really take in the feedback people are giving you, to really consider it deeply and, and respect that people are coming from different perspectives and different uh, circumstances than you. So like I remember one of the answers, uh, I'd used some wording or a particular word that was uh, apparently difficult for people who, for whom English wasn't their first language. And this was obviously something I'd never considered, English as my first language, I don't speak anything else. And writing it, I was just like, yes, this seems like the right word to use. But then people come up and are like, what, what does this mean? What are you saying here? And really listening to them and saying, OK, well, how can we phrase this in a way that will be clearer to a, a broader range of people is uh, important. So uh, in the end, it took about uh, four months, uh, 416 comments, 42 commits, and 29 uh, participants. And that was all, by the way, just for the, the first, first version. Because there have been changes and improvements since then. We've added more questions and more answers, uh, updated answers. There, there are some answers right now that need, need fixing. Um, I know there's a, an answer on higher kinded types that uh, is not great and needs improvement. That, and and I, there are others. Just, just, you know, they, things can always be improved. You get more feedback from people. This is really a doc, right, getting good documentation is a continuous process. Like it doesn't stop when you've published the thing and you're like, okay, I'm done. You want to keep getting that feedback. You want to keep uh, collaborating with people when they come up with some new way of phrase something, some, some new idea, to really incorporate that and, and make sure that your uh, documentation is the best that it can possibly be. Good docs uh, require empathy, they require collaboration, they require time, and they don't happen on accident. And I think that this is just Im important to remember that your, your documentation isn't just going to suddenly get, get good uh, without some real 
effort and attention and time given to it. It's, it you really have to, to want good docs for them to happen. So given all this, I want to talk a little bit about uh, where documentation is right now in the, the Rust ecosystem. So first, the, the Rust ecosystem is, is quite big now. Uh, as of Monday, when I made this slide, uh, there are 6,639 crates and 79,771,988 downloads. So this is awesome. It's super cool to see uh, this many crates, to see that a uh, little over a year past 1.0, the, uh, the ecosystem keeps growing. And uh, for this, basically, I looked at the, the number of, like the, the, how the docs are for the top 100 crates. Would have done more, but be, as this was a, sort of a manual process, there was only so many crates I was willing to go and check the docs for. <laughs> um, so looking at the, the top 100 crates, basically no docs provided means that there's either no link to documentation or that the link that's given is broken. Um, I think there was only one broken link. Um, the other ones just, just weren't there. Uh, poor quality means that there, there may be like a couple of doc comments, but it's, for the most part, there's really not much. Um, al almost everything is, is undocumented. Uh, fair quality is maybe you've got like half of your stuff that's covered by doc comments, but there are large portions of the API that aren't documented. And then good quality is like everything's got documentation. Um, and all of this, by the way, is looking just at the documentation that's linked from crates.io. Once again, just like a time thing, I couldn't go in and do like a deep dive with all uh, 100 of the top crates. And you know what? This is, uh, this is pretty good. Uh, we've got roughly half of the, the top 100 crates that really have quality documentation. This is looking at uh, crates like uh, uh, Regex has, has really good documentation, uh, Lazy Static, uh, Byte Order, things that just are uh, clear documentation, says exactly uh, what, how to use this thing, what all the different parts are, how they work, um, and that's uh, it's really exciting. But there is room for uh, improvement. Uh, not, not just in the, the API docs, not just in the docs linked from, from crates.io, but in the rest of the sort of docs portfolio that I was talking about earlier, uh, making sure that the, the readme is clear, making sure that there's you know, some sort of walkthrough. Uh, first, lots of the docs are, are incomplete. Like I said, there are some of these uh, sort of poor quality and fair quality docs that don't have complete documentation coverage of their uh, API. Um, things that just could, could use some more love. Uh, and then you have docs that, that don't explain enough. Maybe they, they have comments, but they're sort of not, uh, not helpful. Um, the, the funniest one I've seen, and I don't have a particular example from the, the Rust community, but I've seen docs before that are just uh, sort of circular, like you have the name for something, and then the documentation is just the name set again. It's n not helpful. Uh, and, and so it's just sort of that, that sort of stuff, making sure that not only are the docs there, but that they're good, that they're helpful, that someone you know, coming to your library for the first time can actually use them to, uh, to get up to speed. But uh, good, good news, everyone. Uh, the, the foundation is already laid. Uh, one thing that I, I really appreciate in Rust is one of the things that I, I personally love about the Rust community is that people actually care about documentation. Uh, I've seen other programming communities where it's, it seems to be less of a, of a focus, at least at like the sort of core language level, and that can be really frustrating as a user. Uh, but the, the Rust team clearly, I think, cares about documentation. There's been all the work on the, uh, the Rust book and the, the new edition of the Rust book, all the stuff on the API docs, um, the, the sort of recent formation of the Rust docs team, and I believe they had like a, a docs day, sort of focusing contributions on documentation. Uh, it is nice to know that a, as a community, we seem to care about documentation. And uh, Rust doc is, is super cool and getting better. Um, it is just wonderfully nice to have something that is sort of standard, everyone uses, uh, comes with the language, integrates with everything nicely, um, and it's just, it's, it's a good tool. I, I don't know about you guys, but I've been very happy in my experiences uh, using Ru uh, Rust doc, and am, am happy to know that there are things now like uh, docs.rs exist, where it's very easy to get the, the current documentation for, uh, for different crates, and it'll be, uh, it's just, it'll be nice to see this system uh, continue to improve as improvements come to, uh, to Rust doc. Uh, so at this point, it's really a question of uh, focus and planning, making sure that we're actually giving our attention to documentation, that libraries are, are deciding, hey, this is something we want to work on, and then putting in the, the resources to make that happen. Uh, so the question now is, where do we go from here? Like, What are the actual substantive uh, next steps 
to improve our documentation from where it is right now? And I think the answer is different depending on your sort of uh, role in the ecosystem. So if you're a, a crate developer, I think the first thing is to review your current docs portfolio. What do you have? What do you not have? Are there things that aren't covered or things that are covered insufficiently? Um, and this is the sort of thing we're talking about the process earlier. You want to reach out to your users. You want to find out what do you not understand? What do you not get? What's unclear? Um, where, where can we really get the most value out of focusing our uh, attention? And uh, next is to offer mentored docs issues. So uh, mentored issues in general, I think, are a really cool thing and a really nice way to get people into uh, contributing to a library, get people into just understanding uh, your library more. Uh, and I think that offering mentored issues on documentation where you can sort of uh, pair with, with someone who, who knows the internals but maybe doesn't want to devote all of the time and resources to actually writing it. And so you get this nice sort of supportive relationship. We have someone that wants to, to get into writing documentation for this thing or wants to get into the library and can, can get knowledge from the more skilled person who then doesn't have to devote quite as much uh, time and attention into writing the documentation themselves. And so I think it's, it's a really nice uh, solution for everyone. And then uh, I also think treating uh, docs contributors like code contributors, not uh, discounting them. I think that they, it's easy when you're in like a, a technical field to discount or undervalue non-technical work and, and to assume that like the, the technical work is, is the most valuable work and if someone's doing something else, it must be because they're like not good enough or not the skill to do the technical work um, and that that's like a, a judgment or a bad thing. I think it's important to recognize and value any sort of contribution that people make to, uh, to the libraries and things that you're working on. And so that can you know, it be as simple as making sure that people who are contributing to your documentation are getting recognized as contributors to the project, like if you maintain some sort of contributors list, making sure that people who are writing docs are, are ending up in there. Um, and then just sort of the, the way you interact with people who are writing docs, making sure that, it's, that you are treating them you know, with, with respect and sort of, uh, professionalism. Uh, and then next, con consider doing doc days or doc sprints, sort of a you know, short little period where you really focus contribution to say, hey, everyone, we're going we're gonna to work on documentation and then get people together to, uh, to make it happen. It's, it's nice, I think, just because it, when you have everyone focused on it, you can get a lot more done than when everyone's sort of haphazardly coming at it. Um, it can be, I think, a really valuable way to, to direct and focus the work. Now, if you are a uh, Create user, that there are also a variety of things you can do. First, report docs issues when you have them. It's really easy, like when you've come to a library and the documentation is, is missing or something's not clear, to just say, okay, well, I'm, I'm not going to, I'm just gonna leave, I'm not gonna participate in this anymore. And that is certainly fine for the, the crate user, but then it creates this problem where the, the crate maintainer may not, you know, they don't know that you looked at this thing and then left because of a particular reason. They don't hear about, you know, why did you leave? And so it's easy then for the, the maintainer to miss out on important stuff that they're doing wrong that's causing people to leave uh, or, or to not start. And so I think just if there's a problem, if you find something that's unclear, that's missing, just say so. Just open up an issue and say, hey, I don't know that I'm going to use this thing, but I found this particular issue and th this is kind of a, a blocker for me. I don't really understand what's happening here. And then that, that really helps the, the crate maintainer to understand where their deficiencies are and focus their work better. Next, to participate in docs discussions. So you don't even uh, have to do much. It's just sort of showing up and, and giving feedback, uh, whether it's feedback on, on the language that's being used, so you know, making sure that the wording is clear, like the people who told me that my, uh, I, I'd used some wording that wasn't clear for people who uh, didn't have English as a first language. That was really valuable, and that was stuff that I never would have gotten on my own. Uh, and so participating in these discussions, providing the uh, unique sort of perspective from people with a wide variety of uh, technical backgrounds and, and personal backgrounds is really valuable. And then finally, and this is probably the most obvious one, contribute to the docs. If something's unclear uh, and you understand it, write an explanation. Uh, and this is, is a really valuable way and you know, maybe look for some mentored issues. Yes, do that. So uh, I think there's a lot of things that can be done to improve where documentation is right now. Um, and then for, uh, for everyone, let's make Rust more welcoming and uh, productive together. So uh, I actually planned for a question period uh, with the talk rather than after. So uh, questions, comments? Someone want to yell at me? Sure.
Yeah, that's definitely a good idea. And I know that I've seen docs that, that do stuff like that where you'll, you'll have a, a sort of a quick, easy way to go straight from the documentation to opening an issue. Um, I think that's a good idea. I think lowering the sort of barrier to giving that feedback makes more people, make, makes people more likely to give that feedback. Yeah, absolutely. The the more you can lower that barrier, the uh, the more likely you are to, to really get feedback, and I think the better off everyone is. The user is better off because they have to do less work to, to tell you about a problem, and the maintainers are better off because they're going to get probably more feedback, um, have fewer people who just decide, oh, this isn't worth the trouble and, and move on. <coughs> yes? It is. Yeah, I agree. I think it's easy just because like Rust doc is, is there for everyone and it's been there for a while to sort of forget that it's really cool that Rust doc exists and is there. Uh, it's, it's valuable, like I said, when you don't have it, it's something that you really miss. Yeah. Uh, oh, I should, I should explain the term meet cute for anyone who's unfamiliar. The, a meet cute is a term that comes from film. It's the name for sort of the scene where like, uh, like two characters ha like who's gonna have some sort of romantic interest first meet. Uh, you commonly see it in like romantic comedies and stuff. Uh, so it's th it's that first scene where the two characters meet. So yeah. Yeah, I think it depends. Um, that there are sort of as I see it, if people are coming from crates.io, there's sort of two ways you could consider linking to things. Or I guess because you've got the the documentation link, and you also would have like the repository link. And so I think you want to make sure that both of those places are, are potentially directing people to uh, a walkthrough. I've also seen for, uh, for smaller crates that you'll sort of put the walkthrough in the, the crate level documentation. So like when you first hit the, the Rust doc, docs, that that has sort of a quick rock walkthrough at the beginning. And I think for, for smaller crates that can be a good thing. Although obviously for larger crates that could become really unwieldy and, and awful. Uh, so yeah, I think that that's a, be the way to do it. It might be interesting actually to provide some way right in, in Rust doc uh, to like have block buttons of some sort where you could put like at the top of your, your first page like your crate documentation a link which is very big and obvious to say hey if you want to walk through go here rather than like a smaller textual link. And that may be something to do in, in Rust doc to make directing people that way uh, easier. Uh, it sure. I uh, was asking, is the the Rust ecosystem largely uh, English centered? And I would say, I, mean, I haven't looked at the the whole thing, but uh, yes, I, I would I believe so. And that's another thing I think to to think about is the possibility of, of providing uh, documentation in in other languages. Although obviously, often there you're going to be relying on on other people, and you need to find people essentially who are willing to contribute uh, translations. I know this is something that the Rust website has been working on uh, fairly recently added, started adding alternative translations and now uh, is slowly working on, on improving those and adding to those, and making the Rust website available in other languages. And it's, it's a real uh, process, but it's also, I think, very valuable. Uh, I don't believe so, but someone could correct me if I'm wrong. 
Okay. Anyone else? Yes. 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 For anyone who, who's not familiar, uh, you can use a, a, an attribute on your crate to uh, cause a build to fail if you are missing documentation on uh, your, your public API. Now, obviously, this can't check that the documentation is good. It can just check that it's there. But, but that's, a, that's at least a really solid starting point, and it's something I think that everyone should do. Yes. Okay, cool. I didn't know about that. Awesome. So for anyone who couldn't hear, he was saying that there's a, a Clippy lint that, that does some, some uh, sort of checking of the, the text inside of your comments for uh, certain uh, attributes. So that's really cool. Anyone else? Okay, well, thank you very much.